I'm Mike Vardy. Meal planning is important because it prevents us from being a disappointed wreck when dinner time comes around and we have no clue what to make or even if we have the ingredients to make the meal. It's a time and a money saver, but most importantly, it frees up valuable brain space. Creating a meal plan prepares us for the week to come and gives us peace of mind that we're organized and can feed ourselves and our family. That's why I do it, and that's why Plan to Eat helps me do it. Your subscription includes access to the Plan to Eat website and fully featured mobile apps on iOS and Android. And Plan to Eat gives you the tools to clip and organize recipes from any website, the ones your family loves and that fit your dietary preferences and needs. And you can create a meal plan around your schedule. Then what happens is the Plan to Eat software automatically creates an organized shopping list based on your plan. So sign up for your free trial at plantoeat.com slash timecrafting. That's plantoeat.com forward slash timecrafting. The coupon will be automatically applied to your account and can be used when you're ready to subscribe. It's valid for new customers only. Give Plan to Eat a try today. And this is the Productivityist Podcast. Man, this was a fun episode to do. I had such a great time chatting before and after with Dan Lerner and Alan Schlechter here on this episode. We're talking this positively speaking because it was just a fun episode. We talked about positivity a, 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 amongst other things. And yes, there's some comic book references, so fair warning. And also, uh, there's some. I think there's some drinking, um, but I, don't, I think it's just water, but there's some clinking of glasses and stuff. So just bear with us during the audio. And of course, it's in New York City, so you might hear some uh, sirens go by occasionally and so on and so forth. Not much we could do about that, but what I can do for you is share, you, uh, share with you a little bit about uh, the guest this week. So Dan Lerner is a clinical instructor at NYU, and he has a master's in applied positive psychology from the University of Pennsylvania, where he serves on the teaching staff. He also works with musicians, athletes, and executives to improve their performance through developing a healthy psychological state. He's also the co-author of You Thrive, and we're going to get to the book uh, during this episode as well. Now, Alan Schlechter, MD, he is a clinical assistant professor at NYU Langone Medical Center and the director of child psychology psychiatry clinic rather at Bellevue Hospital that's a mouthful he seeks to provide the best possible mental health care to the most vulnerable children and families in New York City and of course you know that's the stuff that they gave me to read he's also a, an avid connect four player and these guys are um they're the best of friends and uh you can hear it in in our conversation and we had a great time let's just get into this episode of the productivity podcast with my guests Dan Lerner and Alan Schlechter let's get started I'd like to welcome Dan Lerner and Alan Schlechter to the Productivity is Podcast. Thanks for joining me, gentlemen. Thank you for having us. This Thank is, you very much. This is this is uh, this is going to be one of those episodes where we've got a lot of guys on a mic. Mike, we just finished talking about different parts of the world that we, we uh, you know, where we live in in different parts of North America. I live in Victoria. They live in New York. I love New York. That you know, the West Coast is is some place that they want to come, especially Victoria. We just talked about comic books, which you know. Anyone who's been listening to my show for a while knows I'm a huge, you know, comic book fan. So we've already warmed things up, and this makes me happy. This makes me really happy to go <laughs> into this conversation, and it's it's, me too. it's fitting because you guys, this is this is this is kind of where what you guys are into, both of you. So why don't we talk a little bit about? Um, let's talk about positive, like the the power of positivity when it comes to productivity, um, especially. Uh, uh, why don't we start with uh, Dan? Why don't you tell us a little bit about you know how how being positive and, and having a, a positive mindset can really help you with, with kind of following through on the things you both need to do and really want to do. I think that's a good place to start off. Uh, it's, it's a great place to start off actually. So thank you. Um, you know, it's an interesting one. Everyone, everyone wants to have positive emotions. Right? Most people want to have positive emotions. And you know, the idea that we just want to be happy is a wonderful thing, but the, what if we take it one step further? What does happiness do for us? I mean, yeah, it's great to feel good. It's great to have a smile on your face, and, or or whether it's calm or joy or thrilled or 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 safe. You know, positive emotions are are, are clearly important. But when we look at the idea of being productive, they actually do really interesting um, things to our brain. So, in some of the studies that that we tend to share talk about um, how people operate differently when they're primed with positive emotion. Uh, we talk about uh, one study that dealt with five-year-olds and how those five-year-olds who were prompted to simply think of 
uh, the things that, that made them happy, right? The prompt was, please think about something for the next 30 seconds that, 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 uh, that made you really happy, how they perform better um, on basically tests of kind of Legos, putting things together. They were more productive. They're more collaborative. They're more accurate. And then we jump to physicians and we do something similar, which is when we prime them with positive emotions, really simply, they give them a bag of candy and they're made to feel better. Uh, they diagnose uh, symptoms uh, up to 20% uh, to, to more accurately. So we're seeing accuracy when it comes to positive emotions. We're seeing uh, collaborative work when it comes to positive emotions. We're seeing um, uh, uh, a number of different benefits, right? At the same time, anytime we're striving to be productive, we're really pushing ourselves, there's often a level of stress. Uh, that comes with that. And if we're pushing ourselves to, to, to do something, stress is a natural thing. But what we found in other studies is that when we're primed with positive emotions, we deal with stress better. Our cardiovascular systems recover better. Uh, they, don't, they don't hijack us, so to speak. So um, whether we're trying to be more productive, more accurate, less stress, so on and so forth, and that's just for starters. Positive emotions go a long way. They do more than just make us feel good. Now, how how can having you know an optimistic outlook on life and, and, and optimism in general, how can that lead to saving time? Because it, it's not something that people would normally think that it, there, there's a correlation there. You know, Alan, why don't you take that one? The I'm I it is very generous offer to let me take that one, but it's more of a Dan <laughs> one. But that is such a Dan question. <laughs> Um, now, if you want to ask me what planet uh, does Hal Jordan go to? Uh, oh, uh, oh uh, to, come on. Oh, I know, uh, I know like, the answer. I don't need to ask you that. You know, and there is, a, <laughs> there, there is actually a Green Lantern planet. That There is a planet that itself. Mo Mogo, yes. Mo Mogo, that's right. So yep. that I can do. But when it comes to optimism, I'm going to defer to Dan. And, 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 I, so just refer, and then I've got one for you right after. So, Dan, why don't you okay. take that one? Wow, Alan, that was a really nice way to, to put that one on me. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> so, you know, optimism is a really interesting one when it comes to productivity, again, um, because, again, we're pushing ourselves, right? And when we're trying to be productive, the odds are that we're not always going to get there. We're not always going to be as productive as, as we'd like. We're going to make mistakes. Uh, we're going to falter. We're going um, to slip up. And one of the things that optimism does is help us work through those challenges, right? So let's say you're, you're trying to get something done. We, we work with a lot of college students. Let's say they take a, a test. Or for other listeners who are not in college, they have a big meeting. They have a big presentation. And it doesn't necessarily go as well as they'd like. Well, what happens, we found with students and everyone else beyond college, is that when you're pessimistic, it's a lot harder to get up and try again. Uh, with optimists, we look at things and think, wait, you know what? These kind of things happen. It's an opportunity for us to, uh, for me to try again. It's not like just I bombed the test or did poorly in a uh, in presentation or a meeting that it affects everything else in my life. It's like that was one meeting, that was one day. Tomorrow's another day. I can get back on the horse. I can ride it again. I can do even better. So um, uh, we don't hit the wall in a way that pessimists do, which go, which often will say, ah, you know, apparently this is not right for me. I'm not good enough, and I'll probably never be good enough because. Uh, because when pessimism hits, it tends to be uh, wide-reaching. You know, I, I bombed the test. Maybe I'm not that smart in any of my subjects. Maybe my friends realize I'm not that smart. Maybe I'm not going to do so well in the ball game that I'm playing in tomorrow. Maybe th th that girl I want to ask out, well, maybe she won't like me either. And they tend to spread. But with optimism, it tends to stay much more local. Yeah, it's one test, one meeting. Okay, next up, let's go. You know, even if we look at a great study by Marty Seligman, he looked at baseball players back in 1986, baseball teams. He found that uh, when he collected the, uh, the press clippings from all of the New York Mets that season and all of the St. Louis Cardinals that season, the way they talked about bad days were very, very different. The Mets would say, yeah, it was one, I had a bad game. Or, you know, they hit really well. It's not me. It's, it's something else. Well, the Cardinals would say, we're having a terrible season. We can't hit. What the hell? Let's just face it, right? Or um, I'll, I just don't have the skill to steal a base. And that came from the player who led the league in stolen bases the year before. So they tend to shut down for the season, or they shut down more for the semester. And for non-students, they shut down for more of their life. So it allows us to really push forward in a productive way. 
Okay, so I, I want to talk a little bit about developing positivity early on because I think that like I'm, I'm a we're all parents here, you know. I mean, it, it's I get to see my kids every single day because I work from home, so I get to see them constantly. How important is it to instill that that the the idea of being positive or or, or having an optimistic outlook? How important is that to start you know as early on as possible? Is that something you want to jump into, Alan? This is Alan. I, that I, I'm all over that. Actually, Alan, let me let me take this one too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so optimism. When they tried to look at the genetics for optimism, they actually weren't that strong. And when you want to talk about imparting an optimistic attitude uh, to a child, and which is, and optimism is a really key component of resilience, your ability to bounce back. It's actually very transgenerational. Just as you can pass down traumas um, from generation to generation, you actually pass down resilience and optimism. And you tell stories to your kids from a very young age. I tell, I have an eight-year-old and a seven-year-old girl right now, Maisie Marlowe. And I talk to them about how my father, who's alive, that when I was their age, he actually was very, very sick. And we were very, very worried as a family, but the whole family, we all took care of each other and my dad got better. And it's a way of talking about illness and it's a way of talking about all of the things we did to stay together as a family and things that we did um, that made me feel good at that time. And when, and I, I would say the biggest way we show optimism to our kids is less pointing it out to them, which parents love to do, but much more showing them, you know, when we get stuck in the airport for three hours, are you the parent that says, this really sucks? Or are you the parent that says, okay, it's, it's time to play the ultimate game of war, and which happened to us. And we bought three decks of cards, and we started playing this crazy game of war together. And, you know, that moment where things are difficult, you say, how are we going to make the most of this? How can you see it in a slightly different way? Yeah, I mean, I, it's one of the things that I try to do with my kids is showing them is so important. And and, and I think that that playfulness is something that I really like to, to show my kids. We talked about this before yeah. we jumped on the air is that like I've got Lego figures. I can see them and they're specific. See, this is the other thing is I love avatars, right? So I've got mm -hmm. the Lego calendar man from the Batman Lego set. He's there because I'm a time management guy. I've got you know, uh, syndrome, because I use his quote mm -hmm. from the Incredibles in a talk. Of course, I've got Green Lanterns everywhere. I've got Vision, the, the Marvel character, because <laughs> Vision's important, and, I believe. So all these things, and my son, he loves coming into my office and just seeing all of the the the, the playfulness there. How, how powerful can <laughs> playfulness be when it comes to not just positivity, but also how that can help with performance? Dan and I would have to arm wrestle this. <laughs> and what you can't see is I'm quite a bit stronger than Dan. <laughs> in the nose uh, so area. In the nose could, area. We could just agree right now that I'd win that. No, actually, Dan is stronger than me. Dan, you want to take this or well, you know what? I actually love for you to take it. But what you know what, what I'd love what I'd love to share is is your observations like spot on. And I'd say that, you know, they actually they actually uh, affect a number of different ways that we can help our kids. So if we look at mindset, like a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset, the idea that I have the ability to learn. I have the ability to change. We can look at studies, for example, of fifth graders. I believe this was done by Carol Dweck, these studies, mm -hmm. uh, that, that showed when fifth graders were read two different kinds of biographies, uh, mm. both, uh, on both sides of Albert Einstein, uh, in each case of Thomas Edison, in each case of Helen Keller. One set of biographies were the idea that they were born really, 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 really smart, right? And the other set of biographies were that they worked their way to success, and we find that those fifth graders who were read the latter, that they worked really hard, are then far more likely to ask for help. They're far more likely to accept tutoring. They're far more likely to take on bigger challenges. So just by being surrounded by, by exemplars, by role models, or re being read stories, or being, even being around other people, um, for example, when we're around people who show greater willpower, we're far more likely to do it ourselves. So no matter what it is, when we tell them stories or show them examples, they're more likely to emulate optimism, willpower, um, growth mindset. And so I think what you're talking about, be it action figures or otherwise, it has to resound with them. And sharing those stories are, are, are really, really important. So I'll take that. 
Alan, if, if you want to take the rest of that, be my guest. Well, Dan and I were actually just teaching the class. We, we have a whole section on the body. And and we talk about how throughout the lifespan right now. And by the way, I'm he, sorry. The, and the class we teach, just, just just for our listeners, is the class called The Science of Happiness. And, and we're going to dive in. We're going to dive deeper into because people like Science of Happiness, they'll want to know. Well, I'm going to want you to unpack that a little bit in a second. But let's get back to Alan. Sure. I'm sorry. Go, so, go on. Yeah. So the idea, we have a whole section on the body. And as people get older, they exercise less and less and less. But we didn't, you know, start out the first five years of our life thinking, oh, I better wake up and exercise today. It was just built into us that play was a natural uh, quality that children have. When Dan, when Dan's son Julian and my daughter Maisie uh, saw each other recently, within two seconds, they are playing tag. They are running all around. And... And that is actually how kids learn. So it's not, I think many parents think that when they're doing playtime, it's kind of frivolous. It's, it's a little icing on the cake, but it's actually the cake. Mm-hmm. That when we play with our kids and they build up that intense bond with us, they love to play with us so well, that's actually how we are then later on able to set limits with them. Because when they love to play with us so much, they're much more likely to follow our direction later on, and much more likely when I say, "That's going to be, that's going to be too much," or "We're not going to be playing um, in a little bit," then they're going to say, "Wait, I want to keep playing with that person." So play is essential. People come to me all the time, and they want to talk about how to discipline their kids first. And I usually know the first thing they need to know is how to play with them better. Right. Ooh. Right. And it's, it's, it's interesting because one of the things we just picked up not too long ago, uh, Tim Ferriss recommended the Monopoly card game. I don't know if, you, if you've seen this, but it's literally a deck and you can play a game of Monopoly with this thing in 15 minutes. It's, it's, oh. it's, it's amazing. My son who's seven is killing us in this game regularly. He <laughs> understands it because it's, it's, it's a simpler version of the game. you, you have to get three full complete sets of properties to win. That's the way you win. You don't have to have it the most. You just have to have three. And it. it literally is. Um, my wife does not like board games very much. My son is very competitive, but it's such a. Um, we, so we normally buy collaborative games for him. And that's the, one of the things I love about board games right now, too. Yeah, there's a lot of collaborative ones. Mm. But this game takes us 15 minutes. We, we get that quick hit of play that he needs. And plus. And, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, too. It breaks a pattern because there's so many patterns that that kids and people can fall into. I can easily fall into the pattern of, uh, you know, checking, reading, reading articles on, online. Uh, my mm-hmm. son and, and we're seeing this more often with kids in general screen time, like it, it breaks that pattern and gets you into something else. And I think that that like, what do you think about that disconnection or stepping back so that you can you can kind of, you know, move forward with more energy and focus going forward. How, how does that play into the whole scheme of things? And just to, just to, this is Alan, just to clarify that question. And, and I think it's, it's actually a lifelong challenge for everyone these days, but you're really talking about um, the power of human interaction in the way um, and in, in interacting play with, a person in, in real, across, yeah, in, in real space. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to, you know, like, Hey friend, like, cause so we, we all, a lot of evidence. Yeah. Cause we all grew up with friends. Like you guys are friends in real life. Like you, yeah. you, you see each other and yet, and I mean, our, I think our kids, our generation is going to grow up with their friends are mostly ones that they've maybe met once or twice that they know on Facebook. Right. Right. And, and Dan and I, by the way, one of the things that cemented our friendship and led to, uh, you know, an occasional uh, physical conflict between us was <laughs> backgammon. Was uh, backgammon. Oh. oh, man. He's so good at it. I love you for saying that. <laughs> it's so, true, man. So, it's taken me, taken me two years to be able to say it. <laughs> this is like the first time I've said it. And, you know, you know we're, not, no, we're not in the same, you know. Yeah. I, mean, I can't even go there so, right now. <laughs> but... But so when you're playing games, uh, and you and you said it really well that um, games are really changing right now. Board games they're getting so much better as I think a reaction mm-hmm. to the internet. Like they had to remodel themselves because mm. video games are so engaging. 
you do go into flow when you play them, even if it's a very kind of junk flow. But when you're playing a board game, you're still moving. You're still, you're, you're still physically active. You're shifting around the board. Um, it, it's, and you get that human interaction. You have to work with another human. The, the mirror neurons in our brain are still lighting up. So there's a lot of evidence for them being actually amazing ways of learning rules. Just as you said, learning how to compete uh, that's wonderful, but also learning how to actually enjoy the game. We talk about this all the time with kids is I say, you know, I draw a line on the board and I say, if, if this is the total time, I play a lot of connect four. Yeah. If this is the, I, I read the bio. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I love connect four. If this is the total time we played connect four for 20 minutes, Winning and losing is really like a microsecond. It, it is just that last little moment. And then we go on to the next game. Would you rather have a great time for 20 minutes or, and then only, you know, and just be upset for that one little moment, or would you rather hate the whole game and then be happy for one moment when you win? And, you know, most kids will be like, well, I'd rather be happy for the longer period of time. It's like, yeah, you got to enjoy the game at some point. It can't just be about the winning. So you, you get to teach so much when you play games with kids. All right. So let's unpack your course that you guys teach, the science of happiness. So I just want to know, uh, how do you be happy? <laughs> oh, well, that's easy. Let's just, let's just do this. And right now, let's just yeah. solve everybody's problems in that you've got uh, 10 minutes. Go. <laughs> up, up well, we could, we could have asked that up front. We could have made this into like a six minute podcast. <laughs> Come on, man. You know, so I'll tell you what, the, the way that we address this is that, and we say this very early on in the semester is uh, you know, we, our class is called, our course is called the science of happiness. And we tell the students that, you know, it, 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 it's not really a course about the science of happiness. Happiness is absolutely a part of the course. We have a class on positive emotions but if you want to, if, if we called it what it could be called, which is the science of well-being or the science of thriving, we'd have like seven students. Ah. The reason we have four hundred, the reason we have four hundred seventy-five students is because it's the science of happiness. Everyone wants to be happy. When we break it down for them, we try to keep it reasonably. Um, we try to keep it simple. We try to keep it manageable. Otherwise, no one wants to get overwhelmed. And what we do is we offer one one of the theories. That is uh, kind of one of the leading theories right now about, about living a, f a fulfilling life, uh, which is called PERMA. It's, again, Marty Seligman's theory from the University of Pennsylvania. And PERMA uh, stands for positive emotions, uh, engagement. The R is for relationships. The M is for meaning. And the A is for achievement. And basically, the idea is if each of those are buckets, we don't need to have them all overflowing because that's not realistic. Right? But we need to have at least a drop in each one. Right. So and everyone's, everyone's uh, levels are going to be different. So, for example, if you have great achievement, that A in PERMA, that's fantastic. But if you have a, a, a totally dry barrel when it comes to the R in relationships and you have no one to share those achievement with, those achievements with, how wonderful can they be? Not as wonderful. Right? If you have um, great meaning but you really don't have much positive emotion, it's really hard to be thriving in your life. So happiness is, is one element. It's the positive emotion part. But if you really want to be thriving, this one theory, and there are, there are numerous theories, uh, would say, focus on these five areas. If you're not feeling terrific, maybe you should look and see how you're doing in each of them. Maybe you need to focus on one of them to get a bit more in that bucket. Now, that being said, the other thing we say to our class, and we always preface it by saying it's the cheesiest thing we'll say all semester, and it pretty much is, uh, is that you are all beautiful little snowflakes. Uh, and then they groan. And rightfully so. Uh, but the idea is, look, for you in the sitting in the front row, maybe emotions are really essential to you and you need a lot of them and you need a little bit of engagement. But for you in the third row, maybe engagement's really your thing and you need fewer emotions. So focusing on those five, but also understanding uh, what's right for you is a, is a really nice way for them to go through this semester and then to go through the year and then to go through their lives um, with a bit of a matrix that they can follow, that they can track, that they can um, they can strive to um, keep um, 
keep well well uh, fed. Right? You know, it's 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 really really cool that you you talk about it in this 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 way because I've been reading a lot more Bruce Lee lately. You know, the martial artist, and one of the sure. things, the quote that he throws out there that that I keep coming back to when it comes to productivity, time management. Because, and by the way. You're right. The science of happiness. People, it's like Tim Ferriss's four hour work week. You know, people are going to yeah. buy that book, but it's really not about working four hours. It's feeling like you've worked four hours in a week, right? So it's 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 all about it's. It, there's optics there, right? But but right. Lee, right. Lee's quote of absorb what is useful, discard what is not, and add your own to the mix. I think that's a lot of. I mean, I, I like seeing more of that in the world because I think the personal component of things like personal happiness, personal productivity, it's getting lost in the speed of culture. What What are your thoughts on that? Because I think that there's there's because everything moves so quickly, and I know that that um, you know, Alan, you've talked about stepping back and, and you know having those calm and tranquil moments. Um, like I, I, I think that because the culture of speed is just so prevalent that we lose the personal component along the way. Yeah. Go for it, my friend. I, I, I couldn't <laughs> agree with you more that I think it is very, our, most of our media uh, encourages us to seek out happiness. And when we think of happiness, uh, that's a very activated emotion. We want joy. You know, when you think about what you want on your weekend, when you look at pictures of a vacation, it always shows people adventuring in some way. And, but actually, when you look at the positive emotions that most influence, for instance, our immune system. So in the Pittsburgh Common Cold Studies, what they did was they gave um, young adults, undergrads, and people in their 20s, they gave them the common cold. They injected it up their nose, and they put them in quarantine for a week. And they watched, uh, and before they did this, I'm sorry, they uh, assessed their positive emotions and their negative emotions. Turns out negative emotions have much less of an influence on our immune system, but positive emotions had a, a significant impact on our immune response, how long we had the cold. They measured this, by the way, by collecting the Kleenex, by literally connecting um, the snot of the subjects. But what they saw when they looked deeper into what positive emotions most impact our immune system, it's tranquility. It's serenity. It's being calm. And those things, I mean, you are mentioning kids before. Those mm -hmm. are much harder to elicit in kids. And, and I think it's, it's something we forget about a lot. But, you know, when I take Maisie, uh, my older daughter, I just have this very profound memory. And Dan just took his son um, hiking last weekend. But when I took Maisie... Uh, into the woods once we were walking and she's, she just turns and she goes, this is peaceful. I don't even, I had never even heard her use that word before. And I said, what's peaceful? What is peaceful? And she said, I guess less trees, a little more quiet. Uh, she said, less people, a little more quiet, more trees. Mm. And I was like, okay, that's, that's peaceful. You know, I, I would just, I just tack on to that. Just to say, you know, because I, I, I'm so glad you brought up Bruce Lee. He's one of my favorite, one of my favorite guys out there. Uh, and I actually show a clip, we show a clip of him mm -hmm. in, our, in, our, in our class about unique voice, mm -hmm. about sort of realizing you at your best. We show the clip where he talks about, uh, well, the quote is, martial arts is fully expressing myself. Yep. And you know, what's so interesting, one of the many interesting things about, about that quote is that it's not about martial arts being something, and he goes on to expound on this, that he can show people, that he can move really quickly, or he can do all kinds of, kind of phony movements, as he says. Um, but it's about him really having taken the time to, 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 to do what's right for him, to sit back and think about, who am I? What is it that engages me? What is it that I enjoy? What is it that, that gives me... Um, that, that, that allows me to pursue something that I love, not how someone else defines it, but how he defines it. And by taking that moment to step back, uh, what he does to pursue it is really realizing his own, his own path to, to well-being.
You know, uh, um, one of the things that I've, I've found is that when people really finally connect with what they really need and want to do, when they, when they finally take that step back, uh, and I struggled with this. When I, was, I mean, I left a really good job at Costco to eventually do what I'm doing now, which I started mm. off at the lowest possible place when you're doing this stuff, right? Like, it's not like you jump online and all of a sudden everybody knows who you are. It, you, it takes some work and some effort, whereas Costco, you know, you got a paycheck. Everything was coming. It was, And people thought, why would you leave this full-time job that's been giving you five weeks vacation? You're on the way up. And it's, it's, it's about, yeah, I was not, I would go home and I would be miserable. Now that's not to say Costco is not a great place to work. It just wasn't a great place for work to work for me any longer. And I think that not enough people spend time. It's the same. And it's the same thing with tools. I get this a lot too, where people will say to me, what tool should I use for my to-do list? I I say, I don't know. And they say, well, what do you mean? You don't know. I'm like, well, I need to know (laughs) how you work. Like what, what, how would you like to approach your to-do list? Because then I can help you with it, but it's a personal choice. And I think that we have to, um, I think uh, obviously what you guys talk about, I think it, it, it should help people tap into those personal choices and remove some of that, that doubt that they face when they're in the face of what expectations society and, and culture has around them. How does doubt and uncertainty affect people when it comes to positive psychology? Cause it's there and it's always, there is always this, this resistance or this, as Seth Godin called the lizard brain or this, this part of your brain, the fight or flight part, how does that mm-hmm. affect the positivity that you have? and keep you from moving in the direction that you really want to move in. And how do you combat that as well? Well, at Zalan, uncertainty is, is at the heart of anxiety. That, that, that is what we say leads to anxiety, that when you, that fear is true danger, but anxiety is perceived danger. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the first ways that, uncertainty and doubt play into positive psychology. And I think of, you know, when we, we talk about choice a lot and, and Dan can speak to this really well, but that issue of the overabundance of choice in our society Mm -hmm. leads to an enormous amount of uncertainty Mm -hmm. about our decisions and then leads to a kind of paralysis or tremendous uh, regret um, and feeling of loss of opportunity if you make one over another. And, and just, just, to, just to illustrate yeah. that, I mean, let's, let's look at it this way, Mike. Uh, there was a time when, um, uh, and this is, you know, Barry Schwartz talks about this beautifully in his book, The Paradox of Choice. But the idea is there was a time, and you're the same age as us, when mm-hmm. you remember when Walkman first came out. Oh, yeah. Right? So when, when it first came out, you had one kind of headphones. Yep. You had black headphones. And they kind of sucked. And they kind of hurt. You know, and they were kind of scratchy and they kind of like cut your head. Um, but you were stoked, man, because <laughs> mm-hmm. like, you could have like music in your ears and you were walking down the street and you were like, oh, this is amazing. So there was no choice. Th- that's the, those are the headphones you had. And then next thing you know, oh, there was a silver pair. So yep. you had to pick. There's black and there's silver. If you pick the black, well, okay, I didn't get the silver. The silver, okay, I didn't get the black. Big deal. But now you have like beats. And, and a million other kinds, mm-hmm. a skull candy and, and, and high end and low end and colorful and green and blue. And so if you buy one, it's not like you're forgoing another one. It's that you are forgoing a thousand other ones. Yeah. And it, by doing that, you, you all of a sudden you buy one and you, you don't enjoy it as much. You kind of start thinking, you keep thinking about the ones you didn't buy. And that can be painful. And that is what's happened in almost everything we do in life. Thank you very much, Internet, for all the personal reviews <laughs> that don't matter. But you're like, oh, um, you know, yeah, you Bill, foc- Bill, you f- Bill F. Hey, yeah, you, care, you, you focus know? on the crap. Yeah, I mean, when I do it, I mean, that's what happens is you look at the reviews and the one-star ones stand out because they're the ones that, yes. I mean, they glare out at you unless unless they're the majority ones, in which case you've got other things to look at. But with Costco, that's a gr- I mean, I use that example all the time. Costco, you walk into Costco and you want to go buy ketchup. You have two choices. The three pack of ketchup or the giant can of ketchup. And they're both the same brand. So you can do one of three things buy the three pack, buy the can, or don't buy ketchup. And, right? and what happens is is Costco's willing to take the bet that you will that you will buy ketchup because you're already there. And so instead of having 15 different types of ketchup, which also can lead to you not buying ketchup. They're just simplifying right. the process, right? And right. that's why when people go to Costco, the common complaint is I went to the Costco to buy butter, milk, and eggs, and I spent 400 bucks. 
because they weren't fatigued <laughs> by the choices that were all presented in front of them. Instead, they got to kind of be part of the whole experience. And I mean, eating demo, uh, eating food off the demo tables never hurts either. But that's that's that that uh, you know, paralysis by analysis is is a mm. re- is a real thing. Yeah. Well, you hit it right on the money, especially with food. There's a study that was that was uh, that was done on jam um, that had the sample had the had the tasting tables right one table had six kinds of jam uh this was a study done out in menlo park california uh six kinds of jam and the other table that was rotated in had 24 kinds of jam and people would come by and they taste the jam from the table uh that had six kinds of jam 30 percent of the people who um who tasted the jam bought the jam but from the table that had 24 kinds of jam only three percent of the people bought the jam mm-hmm. so in a way costco's doing us a huge favor by saying you got three choices. Pick it. And even if people are like, well, I wanted, I wanted more variety, for most people, it minimizes their worry. It minimizes the choice they have to make. And thus, it minimizes the anxiety or the, the regret they feel for not having bought the 23 other jams. It's, uh, it works for us. Yep. Absolutely. You know? yeah. uh, one, last, one last thing I want to get to before we wrap up. Uh, Alan, we touched on the Green Lantern, which means we can't not talk about willpower before we wrap up. <laughs> we can't it's it's just it's right there um yeah. so i i willpower is the reason i'm a huge green lantern fan is because willpower is something i believe that you really need to have uh and it's an important fuel it's important it's important mm-hmm. part of 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 um and, and i i like to say that i have a pretty solid self-awareness of knowing when i'm best at doing certain things so I know that, you know, we all know that willpower and anyone who's been listening to the show for a while knows that, you know, we only have a certain amount per day and it's how you use it that determines, you know, during the right periods of time and such. I'm a night owl, so I use my willpower sparingly in the early part of the day. And then when Mm -hmm. my creative energy comes up because I know my energy is higher later in the day, that's when I'm ready to take on parallax, right? Like, and and for those, (laughs) that's when I'm ready to take, that's when I'm ready to take on, on the, on the world, right? So what, what is willpower? How, how do you kind of define it and how, how, how important is it that you understand how it works in, in terms of saving you time uh, and maybe frustration and allowing you to optimize the moments throughout your day? I think Dan and I think that willpower is essential. Uh, and so we have an entire class dedicated to the subject of willpower using a lot of Baumeister's work, who's been one of mm-hmm. the premier people to study it. Yeah. And the idea that you need to harness your potential um, is is central to the class. But if you feel like you don't have the impulse control and the regulation and that 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 ability to make the choice between what you want to do, what and what you um, uh, should do so that you can actually make the choice of what you're actually going to do, um, is, is essential. And then I think Dan and I actually have, there's so many different ways of looking at your willpower. I think one of the the biggest domino for me with my willpower, um, and you mentioned that your night owl is very much sleep. That Mm -hmm. if, if I, for me, when it comes to willpower, uh, I think sleep when, when I get a good night of sleep, then I wake up and I eat the right way. And uh, some people really want to connect. Some people would say maybe overconnect the issue of glucose and food with willpower. And that idea is so when I sleep well, I eat well. And when I eat in a really healthy way, that maintains the most willpower I'm going to have for the day. And knowing that, just like you're saying, I know it's around 2 o'clock every day, I have no willpower. Melatonin's coming up in my brain, and it's saying take a nap. And if I let myself take that 15-minute nap, then I have willpower right up until the evening when it's dinner time. And if I can make it to then, and then I have that feeling of achievement from the day. But I want to let Dan speak as well on this subject. I think, you know, Alan hits right in the head when it comes to nutrition and, and how that affects our willpower. You know, the, the, one of the other major ways of looking at willpower is that it's, it's a finite resource. Mm-hmm. Um, and that as, as we use it throughout the day, it's like, it's like a gas tank or it's like a muscle. It's, all, it's, it's like a muscle, right? Once you've gone to, to, to use your muscle, to, to work that muscle say, at the gym, it's tired. And it, it, you've pushed it as far as it's going to go. So trying to, trying to use it again is really tough. You know, in the morning, there's, so there's a reason, for example, why 
uh, why uh, um, Mark Zuckerberg wears the same thing every day because he doesn't have to make his choices in the morning. And any choice we make uh, will will mean we're expending willpower. He just throws on the hoodie, yep. which means no, no choice to be made. Um, and same thing with President Obama and having you know just a couple suits uh, in the closet. Same thing with with Steve Jobs and the black turtleneck. So when we start, when we get up in the morning, if we have 16 choices for breakfast and we have to make that choice, well, we just expended a little bit of willpower. Uh, and it's, it's, we're starting to drain early. If we have one choice, you know, I try to go to like, try to go to my Irish oats every morning. I'm not spending willpower on what I'm going to eat. So everything we do throughout the day, every choice we make, every initiative that we, that we, that we take on, Every time we say no to something or say yes to something, right? every time we say, I'm not going to do that, we're expending our willpower. Thus, if we're able to design our day in a way where we simplify our choices and save that willpower for the things we really need it for, the, um, the, the project we're working on later in the day, then we have that, we have that ready and it's uh, at, at our disposal. And we're far more likely to be able to, 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 to get done what we want to get done. I think that's a great way to wrap up. Although I would say, wouldn't it be great if we all just had lanterns and rings and we could just charge yes. them I mean, at any given time, I, just with an oath, just with an just oath, with an, <laughs> just with a simple oath. And we'd be and good if our to go. only weakness was the color yellow or, or, or wood, wood, wood <laughs> you know? from eons ago. Yeah. That's like, right. When someone said, Oh, the green lanterns weakness is yellow. That's ridiculous. I'm like the former green lanterns weakness was wood. Like, really? I love that you're talking golden age here. <laughs> I love that you just went there. Um, gentlemen, thanks so much for joining me on the show today. Where can people find your work? I know you've got the book, which we're going to link to in the show notes, which, of course, the book is called How to Succeed in College and Life. You Thrive, right? You Thrive is exactly. the name of the book, How to Succeed in College and Life. Um, where can where can people find you online to learn more about the science of happiness and positive uh, positive productivity? Well, you can, you can certainly start with the book site, which is www.youththrive.info. Uh, we have not only is there info about the book, there's info about us, there's info, there are resources that you can go to, uh, assessments you can take online, um, and some really nice links to uh, some great colleagues we have. They're doing really interesting work uh, in, in, in the field of positive psychology. Yeah. Awesome. So, you can, yeah, you can, you, can cert- you can certainly find uh, me at www.danielllearner.com uh, as well. Awesome. And Alan is a youth thrive guy. So, and and yeah. one thing I want to mention too is that uh, uh, my friend Srinivas Rao interviewed you guys for the Unmistakable uh, uh, Creative Podcast. So I'm going to link to that in the show notes as well because Srini nice. does a great job with interviews, and and I think it'd be uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, let people uh, listen to you guys talk uh, on that show as well. It was it was it was you, Dan, wasn't it? it was just you, right? That's right. It was just me. So was just Al- me. Al- Alan and I will we'll we'll talk more about comic books while while everyone else is <laughs> exactly. All right. Th- thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for joining us, guys. Thanks Thank so you. much for having this us. Such it's really a pleasure. Yes, it was. There's more to come with this episode. If you are a Patreon supporter of the show, we talk about the science of passion. It's a cutting edge thing that, that both Dan and Alan are passionate about. Uh, go figure. And we talk about this over at the uh, Patreon edition of the Productivity is Podcast. Now, if you want to become a patron, you can do so for as little as a dollar a month. Head over to patreon.com slash productivityist to get started on that today. Big thanks to John Polstra for producing this week's episode of the podcast, as well as all the episodes leading up to that point. Thanks to my team for putting together the show notes. Thanks to Dan and Alan for joining me on the show. Of course, you can learn more about them in the show notes. And thanks to all of you for listening this week to the show. I really appreciate it. I had a lot of fun. I hope you did too. I'm Mike Vardy, the host of the Productivity Podcast. Until next time, reminding you to stop guessing and start going.